Hi. Did you just go see Professor Schicchetti? Yep. Yeah, you learned about stress? Yeah. Saw so you'll mellow now? <laughs> totally. Or should I check Twitter? Did we talk about Twitter? Yeah. yeah. <sighs> that was really bad. All right, so welcome to the Ethical Tango. I wish we were in a different room because I would love to actually teach you how to tango, but I can't. So we're going to teach you about the Ethical Tango. I'm Professor Holt. You all know me. This is my mother, Dr. Sonia Holt. Yes, I know. Aw. <laughs> she is a psychologist and has been practicing psychology in Colorado for, I'm going to say, approximately 30 years to not give away your age, right? Something That's a big no-no. Uh, she got her PhD from the University of Colorado, so we'll forgive her for that. <laughs> and. What we're doing today is kind of bringing in the psychology of ethics, right? You guys take Psych 101? Yeah? Did you like it? Yeah? You guys want to lay on a couch and talk about your problems? Yeah. She can do that later. She's only like $300 an hour. Just kidding. So we want to talk a little bit about the psychology behind ethics, and I want to start with some pretty interesting research studies, right? In psychology and a lot of the social behavioral sciences, they do a lot of testing, right? They use you guys as guinea pigs often. Have you guys ever done any research projects for the psych department? Yeah, so in 1972, pretty fun fact, it was discovered that subjects who found a dime were 22 times more likely to help someone who had dropped papers than someone who hadn't found a dime. Crazy, right? A dime. Now, in 1972, that's probably, what, five bucks today? So someone who's got five bucks, or fines, five bucks, is 22 times more likely to help another person than if they hadn't found five bucks. Crazy, right? In 1973, it was reported that if a passerby is in a hurry, they're six times more likely to help someone in need than if they aren't in a hurry. So if you're stressed, and you're running to class, and you're late, you're six times less likely to help somebody who's injured or in need. Crazy. In 1975, it was determined that subjects were five times more likely to help an injured man if ambient noise was at a normal level than if there was a power lawnmower nearby. The noise, just loud noise, makes you five times less likely to help somebody in need. And then I think you're going to speak to this one, right, Mom? In 2009, Ariely, a psychologist, found that there was an increase in dishonesty if others are exposed to other people's dishonesty. So if you're exposed to unethical behavior in your peers, you're more likely to engage in unethical behavior. I wanted to tell you a little bit about this experiment. I think it's up and coming. The, um, the author of this um, set of experiments is a behavioral economist out of Duke. He devised a, an ingenious, I don't have time today to, to, to go through the test that he devised, but it's a mathematical test. It's a set of matrices where people are given the chance to solve as many as they can in a certain time period. And he knows in advance how many a person, how, what's the norm on this and what is way out of the norm and what isn't. So they have a very good chance of deciding whether someone is cheating on whether they um, come up with um, how, many, how many right answers they come up with. He's used this, it's called the matrix test, and he's devised a number of different, he's run it into hundreds of different situations. And you'll have to take my word from it now, but I'll have the resources there if you want to look it up. Um, he can tell whether somebody's honest or dishonest based on, at the end of their experiment, um, odds are, you know, like 99% that this person is cheating. Okay, these are the kinds of things he wanted to check. check. Do we, um, are we influenced in being dishonest by what other people do. And one of the things he found is, yes, we are. We're, we're influenced if somebody, if we can see that somebody who's a member of, a, of an out group, like if you're at CU and you have a CSU person who's the one who's cheating, you're not gonna cheat. If, you have, if you're at CU and you, somebody's wearing a CU sweatshirt, you're less likely to cheat. In another experiment, can I have two of those? Another one, he um, had people Recite the Ten Commandments of all things. Re just you know, put on a piece of paper the Ten Commandments. That's fairly universal, um, and different forms of it. He had them recite that. Then he had them take the test. If the people had done the Ten Commandments, they were less likely to cheat than for the group that didn't do it. Which says that if it's on your mind, you're less likely to cheat. Probably part of the logic of doing the ethics boot camp. 
if you have a lot of ethics kinds of instruction and training and sensitization going on in your education, maybe you are more likely to be ethical in your other dealings. This is one I think you might like. They had, um, they've been given uh, some designer sunglasses by Chloe. Is that the right name, Chloe? Kardashian? What? Chloe Kardashian? Yeah, yeah. They, get, they handed them out to their group and they told half of them um, that they were fakes. They told the other half that they, you know, they were Chloe's. Uh, and then I guess they had three groups because they had one group that, that wasn't given any information. The group that thought they were wearing the fakes cheated more. They were all wearing the same ones, but they, they cheated more. So it, it's really interesting to see that there's different external things that can sometimes influence our degree of, of honesty and, uh, and cheating, <coughs> our ethical behavior. And things that you wouldn't even think about, right? Like finding a dime or loud noise can influence it. So we want to talk a little bit today about what is the ethical pain There's job. one more. Can I do it later? The participation? Yeah. One? Okay. Just trust me. I know. I know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> So have any of you danced the tango? Any of you? Yeah, awesome. I used to live in Argentina for a little bit of time in 2007, and I really enjoyed learning how to tango. It's an amazing dance. It's really sensual, which is not the point here, right? But the idea is that it's a very delicate balance, right? It's a lead and follow, and you're, you're really close to your partner, but you, it's a delicate balance that you strive for in this relationship with your partner, that you have to follow and trust each other, and you have to move with each other's steps, right? And so kind of like you're facing in your personal and ethical or your personal and work professional lives, you're gonna always be dancing. You're gonna always be watching that balance, right? The golden mean is a balance on Aristotle's virtue-based ethics that you're constantly striving for this balance in your life and in your relationships, whether they be work relationships, personal relationships, or your school relationships, right? So the idea is that you're constantly doing a tango. And our goal today is not to give you a guideline. We're not going to give you rules. This is, how you be, this is how you should behave. This is what you should do, right? The idea is we want to answer for you the question why people do what we do, right? Why, from a psychological perspective, does that person act in that way? And so this is going to be kind of a what would you do in this situation in reverse, right? It's taking an action that's already happened and looking at it and figuring out why did we act the way we did? Because in essence, in analyzing your behavior in reverse, you may or may not be able to change it going forward. In addition to that, one of the most obnoxious things that seems to come out of most, uh, most training and teaching and preaching about ethics is that people feel coerced. They feel like they're told what they have to do and they're how they're supposed to live. And we know fundamentally in psychology that when people feel coerced, what are they going to do? Resist. We have candy and tickets up here if you participate. <laughs> yeah. So who said coerce? Or resist? Who said resist? I heard it. You want a ticket too, since you're the only one brave enough to participate? So the idea is that we don't want you to resist, we don't want you to feel coerced, we're wanting to help you explain why it is that you're doing something or why it is that your peers are doing something. Make sense? Heck yeah. So do you know who these people are? <laughs> who is this one right here? Mother Teresa, and what is she famous for? What? Raise your hands like a real Catherine. Yeah. Helping the poor and orphans. Helping Great. the poor and the orphans. Great. Great. She's also known for having gotten the Nobel Peace Prize and being considered the most admirable person in uh, in American during uh, by Americans during the 20th century. Do you think that she did a lot of good in this world? No. Yeah. It was pretty selfless, right? Who's this? Bill Gates, what's he famous for? Microsoft, that little dancing paperclip that annoys the crap out of all of us, right? He's yeah. also famous for the dancing paperclip? Yep, that's what, yeah. Okay, and, and what else? Web, and for websites that have him hanging in effigy, and he's even been the victim of pie in the face a number of times. Online? No, not online. People have actually thrown pies in his face? Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that sucks. 
<laughs> People in the software community don't like him much for some of his tactics, right? Because what does he do with Microsoft? What is it seen as? Monopoly, Monopoly right? It's anti-competitive. If you want a Dell or you want an HP, what do you get with it? Microsoft, right? Absolutely. But what else is he known for? Well, do you want to get to that yet? No, you. I want you to tell me. Um, in deciding what to do with his fortune, Gates crunched the numbers and determined that he could alleviate the most misery by fighting everyday scourges in developing third world countries like malaria, diarrhea, and parasites. And he's, de he's de dedicated huge sums of his fortune to helping third world countries. Do you think that's pretty good? Giving away a ton of money, right? Absolutely. Who is that guy? Silence. Crickets. You get 10 tickets if you go identify that guy. Yeah, if you can tell me who that is. <laughs> the rest of my candy and tickets. Can you have a hint? <laughs> But you want a hint? A hint? Yeah. The Green Revolution. Yeah. There's your hint. And this guy's no. name is Norman Burlock. Who in the heck is Norman Burlock? Okay? He's known as the father of the Green Revolution. And what's, what's so big about that? Norman Burlock is credited with saving over a billion lives, more than any other person in the history of mankind. He used agriculture to teach the world how to feed themselves, right? And he's, he saved lives by feeding, by teaching communities to be self-staining and feed themselves. More lives than anyone else in history, but you don't know who he is. Who do you think's more ethical? Who's There's that? no right or wrong answer, but... You're not wrong on this. <laughs> yeah. I would say Norman because for him to be unknown, his humility probably had to be pretty high and come across an ethical virtue in balance with the other two. And so other people probably didn't want, you know, saying she just, you know, got it, couldn't stop it. Um, if you add them all up, Norman, I guess, would have the most of every ethical virtue. Of the virtue? Of okay, no. Yeah. Does anybody have a different opinion? Do you guys all agree? More than Mother Teresa? She's like turning over in her Austin, you said no, why not? Yeah, it sucks when your professor's up here and knows your name. <laughs> She maybe didn't save as many, and, and her work may not continue to keep saving people like Borlaugs did. Yeah. yeah. But anybody she's still have a different? Anybody for Gates? <laughs> I think they're all pretty ethical. They're just uh, doing it, doing as much ethic as they can given their abilities. Honestly. Perfect. Absolutely. You want to give them? Here. We, we like this example. Oh, who else? The cute girl, redheaded girl. I don't know your name. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess and then there's the. Uh, but they're different. They're ethical, they're but on different criteria, like you were saying. And some, some of us might favor one way or another, and the reason we favor one way or another might speak a lot to our own, um, our own personal characteristics and our own, I like the humility part. Um, um, I like the different abilities part. And I don't think anything we say here today is gonna take away Mother Teresa's sainthood. <laughs> Somebody else? 
That's excellent. So the idea, right, is that you guys don't have to be a saint. We're not expecting you to be perfect. We're not asking you to be perfect. If you make a million dollars, we're not asking you to give it all away, right? Or if you have some special skill, well, what we're saying is that there are different ways to be ethical, right? And I think, Austin, you kind of touched on it. What was their motivation behind why they were doing what they were doing, right? We don't know, but we're assuming if they did all this good, there was some type of good rationale behind it. But it's about your perspective, right? It matters about what you're looking at. What background, are you, you looking at their background? Are you looking at their motivations? Why are they doing what they're doing? It depends on how you're looking at it, right? So uh, let me ask you a question. There's a masked stranger. He comes running up to you in a dark alley. And he has several friends with him, right? They put you on some kind of, they, they kidnap you, they take you, and they put you on some kind of table and administer drugs into you that make you go unconscious. And then they start to stab you with a sharp knife. I know, I'm morbid. <laughs> ethical? Who would say that that's ethical? No one? Why is it happening? Great, it's eats, right? <laughs> Why is it happening? Why do you think it's happening? Surgery. So now what if I told you this masked stranger was a doctor? And he and his anesthesiologist friend put you on a table, put you, made you go unconscious, and started stabbing you with a sharp knife to save your life. Now is it ethical? Who thinks? Show of hands. <laughs> so it matters to ask why, right? You have to ask why is it happening. You have to look at it from every different perspective that you can. Excellent. Remind me to give you a candy of these because you're too far away. And if I throw it, I'll probably hit everyone on the way there. All right, so here are the steps to a very basic tango step. You guys ever seen these footprints? Maybe not. Does that look easy? You think you could learn that pretty quickly? Oh yeah, you're all experts over here, right? Yeah. It's a diagram, right? This is a dancing diagram. It's how they teach people to dance the tango. And this is a very basic step to show the four basic steps of the tango. There are really only four steps in a tango dance, and then you add things to it. But these are the four basic steps, and that's the diagram of how you learn it. Do you think just from looking at this, you could learn it? You could go dance it right now? No? What would it take? Practice. practice. I know. Where's my basketball players? Brad, I saw you. You can't hide. Right? It takes practice. You guys have to practice to be good at what you do. Okay. And so same with ethics. You have to practice. You have to participate. So just like we have a dancing diagram, we have a judgment diagram, a behavioral diagram from psychology. But before I get there, I want to tell you about a study, another research study done in 1980. Dr. Holt found that subjects merely learning the rules of a game were more severe in their punishments of wrongdoing than those who had actually just played the game. Those subjects who had participated and played were l more likely to recognize the different seriousness of different levels of infractions or breaking of rules. You want to tell them about your study? I want to tell you about the study. I want to tell you about the judgment diagram as well. And I'm going to do that first, just so I can take you through, the, through it and it'll make some sense. I, I wish I had a laminated copy of this and I could give every one of you one. And I think I'll do that someday that you could carry. I have had this for years. And when I'm trying to figure out or understand what just happened there, or what's going on, I go back to this diagram and it helps me kind of sort through what was going on with that person when they did such and such. What basically it is, is that when you come into a circum set of circumstances, you look at the overall circumstances, that's all the seeds, and those circumstances give you reasons. We're going to talk about those reasons in just a half a minute. Um, but the there are four different kinds of reasons. There's hedonic reasons, prudential reasons, ethical reasons, and aesthetic reasons. We weigh those diff reasons differently. And that's what we found when we were talking about um, Mother Teresa, Bill Gates, and Norman Bullock. They weighted those reasons differently. And as, as a result, they made different decisions and they came up with different behaviors. That's what we're doing all the time. Behavior makes sense. So for years, psychologists have not been really good about letting you know. Behavior does make sense. It's rational, it's reasonable. All we have to do is look for that. Okay, here's the, the study. Um, I wanted to see what would make a difference for 
the number three reasons, ethical reasons. How can we up that for people? And there's a lot of different things that we can do, but in my study, I said participation makes a difference. Okay, it was called the participation hypothesis, and what we did was give fourth graders and, and 12th graders um, a, this one test, and it was when Uno, the game Uno, it had just come on the market, so people were, they were all pretty unfamiliar with it. I gave half of the kids a set of rules from Uno and had them memorize it and take a, take a test on, on the rules of Uno. And I had half of the kids um, play the game. They were guided into how to play the game and they played it for a while and then afterwards they were given 20 examples of how you could cheat in UNO. Now what do you think we got for results? Some, we have those that learn the rules and those that learn the, by participating. Everyone should get this one. <laughs> what happened? What do you think with... Two, pardon? Go ahead. <coughs> Two things happened. Those who participated were more aware of the ways to cheat. And they, they could de detect serious cheating from not serious cheating. <coughs> the second thing that happened, this was fourth graders versus 12th graders. We asked them to punish the cheaters on a scale of one to 10. The fourth graders gave them a 10 or nine or eight every time, punish them, hang, you know, like a hanging judge. <laughs> the 12th graders, what do you think they did? <coughs> <laughs> what did the 12th graders do? The 12th graders <coughs> gave them a warning, is that what you said? A one. A one. Yeah. Well, they relativized it. If it wasn't a big deal kind of cheating, they, they didn't punish them as much. But if it was, you know, if it was kind of a slight, uh, maybe mis, mis deal, you know, dealing more to one person than to another, maybe they would have graded them less. But they, by participating, they knew again, the relative seriousness and the punishment was more appropriate to the crime. And those of you who are in my classes, right, we talked about this on the first day and I imagine the rest of you did too, the different levels of cheating, right? Some of you were more willing to cheat if it was that last day of class. And Mom, you gotta watch your microphone. <laughs> if it was the last day of class and the last exam you ever had, right, more of you, if you didn't study, you were willing to cheat because that didn't seem as bad as the stealing from a store, right? You guys were relativizing how bad those things were because you participated in your life, I'm mean, imagining. So what the diagram does is you take this behavior, right, this action happened. You guys came to the ethics boot camp. Why did you come to the ethics boot camp? You had to. Anyone come other than because you had to? Yeah, why? I love it, Taylor, why'd you volunteer? it's important, right? So based on this behavior of coming to the, be, of the ethics boot camp, you made some judgment, right? You either came because you wanted to and you thought it was important, or you came because you had to and your grade is affected by it, right? But you were analyzing different reasons for coming and giving those reasons different weight. Are some of your classmates not here? Yeah, absolutely. This is definitely not 350 people, right, among the boot camp. But you gave different reasons, different weight for making this judgment and having this behavior. So let's go through the different reasons that we have. First is the hedonic reason. Because not everything you do is based on ethics, right? right? There are other things in life, those gray areas that make us act, and it doesn't always have to do with an ethical reason. So the first one is hedonic. It means you're doing something because it's pleasurable or fun. So what do you guys do because it's pleasurable or fun? You guys are boring, you don't ever have fun? What do you do for fun, Pauline? Sleep. sleep. I love sleep too. And it's six o'clock today, I get to go home and go back to sleep, right? Yeah. What else do you do for fun? Skiing. Skiing. Sports. What? Sports. Sports. Thanks, Victor. What else? Paint my nails. Paint your nails, I love it. What else? Read a novel. Read a novel, a good novel, right? Not Trashy Us Weekly, although I read that this morning, so don't tell Professor C, right? <laughs> But we do things that are fun. So when we're doing things because they bring us pleasure, it's we're doing them because it's hedonic. Or so, avoid them because they're painful. Or avoid them because they're painful. What theory of ethics did you learn about that sounds like this? Yeah, the hedonic calculus, exactly. Your professor must be awesome. <laughs> She's rocking, right? Absolutely. 
So the second one, reasons that we do things. So well, let me ask anyone come to the ethics boot camp for hedonic reasons? Taylor, your hand should be up. <laughs> right. I did. I think this is fun. Right. The second one is prudential. You're doing things or you're, asked, you're answering the question, why did you do that? Because it's in your best interest or avoiding something because it's not in your best interest. So what do you do because it's simply in your best interest? Study, absolutely. It's not fun, right? No. Unless you're a nerd like me, but otherwise, it's because it's in your best interest. What do you get from it after you've studied? An A. Good grades, yeah. And then you go to the border, apparently. <laughs> what else do you do because it's in your best interest? Eat healthy. Eat healthy, right? Doesn't always feel pleasurable because broccoli doesn't taste nearly as good as a donut. <laughs> I agree, right? But that's absolutely one. What else? Exercise. Hedonic, Victor, you don't love to exercise? Thanks. <laughs> but you do it because it's in your best interest, because it keeps you alive, it keeps you healthy, right? Andrew, what else do you do that's in your best interest? Uh, play video games. Play, I would say that that's more hedonic, wouldn't you? Study. Study. <laughs> you can do so much better than that. <coughs> Under what conditions would playing video games be in your best interest? There could, be, there could be, if you're a tester for Nintendo, maybe. Right, if you're a tester, you should get that job. Right? Maybe coming to the booth ethics boot camp, best interest, right? Because you're getting your grade relies on it, possibly. The next one is aesthetic. This is answering the question why you do something because it's fitting or in good taste. So what do you do because it's fitting or in good taste? Yeah. Arrive at the boot camp on time. It's in good taste, right? It's proper. It's respectful. Where's any team respect in here, Taylor? Um, buying certain clothes, like wearing certain things in certain dress. Okay. Like what specifically? That's great. So, like if you were going to an interview, you would hopefully wear a suit or Or your debates, right? You dress up for those. Absolutely perfect. And in an interview, you would wear a suit. Are suits really all that comfortable? No. But you would wear them because it's, yeah, keep, use your other hand. There you go. <laughs> because it's aesthetic, in good taste. Aesthetic covers um, three, three other areas, um, artistic, socially fitting, and intellectual. So the, aesthetic is a broad category. And you touched on, uh, on artistic and you touched on socially fitting. An intellectual might be you know, designing that really good video game. You know, inventing one that was just the super one. Then, then you're operating more uh, from an aesthetic perspective, improving upon. And finally, of course, ethical, right? And so you're doing something because it's the right thing to do or it's a good thing to do. And that's what you've been learning about all weekend, right? But what we're telling you is that's not the only reason you behave the way you do, right? That's just one of four possible reasons. Do you think you could be doing all of them at the same time? Of course, you could be using those different reasons and giving them a variety of different weights at any Sometimes given time. Sometimes that's even considered actualized behavior when you don't have a conflict between any of those four reasons. Um, you're, then you're sailing along fine. It's when you have conflict between those reasons that you have dilemmas. And that's, that's what we have some difficulty with. Now, pop, uh, contrary to popular belief, ethical, ethical reasons don't always trump the rest of the reasons, right? Sometimes it's right to do something that's wrong. Can you think of any? Yeah. Like telling little white lies. If someone, like if you're married and your wife asks you if you'll give them a dress or something, you're saying yes, even if there's no answer. But yes is the right answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely. You might have some challenge on that one. <laughs> she never. Are there any other obvious ones? That's excellent. What's that? But there is the white lie in, in, the, in, in the thing with Kant. You know, where Kant says it's never okay to tell a lie, but if, you, if somebody comes to, the door, to your door and they're seeking um, someone, what's the example? Someone has killed, um, it, it happened to Sartre when he was in France and the Nazis were looking for um, where the Jews were hidden and Sartre was, was knowledgeable about that and, and they came to the door to ask him for directions on how to find them, and he told the white lie. Do you think that's a time when it's okay to do what's wrong? Yeah, Kenny? Did, did you say something Sorry. that I steamrolled? Okay, okay. 
Absolutely. All right. The obvious ones with the right, is it ever right to do something that's wrong? Our self-defense, self uh, killing somebody in self-defense. But it doesn't make killing right when you do that. But sometimes it is right to, to defend yourself. Yourself. And then you'd have prudential reasons. All right. So the idea, like we've talked about throughout this, is that you have to practice, right? Just like you have to practice sports or exercise, you have to practice making ethical decisions, which you're getting a good amount of this weekend in practicing those thought processes, right? And Confucius says, tell me and I may listen. Teach me, I may remember, but involve me and I will do it. So you guys want to practice? Yes, you do. Let's try that again. You want to practice? Yeah. yeah. You know, the more enthusiasm you get, the more fun this is. All right. So this is probably something that you guys are all going to maybe have to do someday. Jim has the responsibility of filling a position in his firm. His friend Paul applied and is qualified, but someone else is even more qualified. Jim wants to give the job to his friend Paul, but he feels guilty, believing that he ought to be impartial. That's the essence of morality, he essentially tells himself. This belief is, however, rejected as he decides that friendship has, has a moral importance that, Im, that permits him and perhaps requires him to, in some circumstances, to give the job to his friend, so he does. What were, what were his reasoning? Of those four reasons, hedonic, prudential, aesthetic, and ethical, what was he using? Hedonic, why? Hedonic was pleasurable, right? So what pleasure does it bring him? Him having his friend at work. They could joke around, have fun, right? Get nothing done. That'd be fun. Want some candy? Awesome. What else? I saw some hands up. Any other reason operating Victor. here? Victor. If he has a friend there, he doesn't have to call his friend there. He can't give him a job. Or avoiding it because it's painful, yeah. right? How many, how, would it be hard to tell your friend not, that they're not getting the job? What do you guys think? Yeah? yeah. Is this ethical? No. no. Who says no? Why not? Well, it said they were more qualified. So if someone's more qualified, then they should get it, is what you're saying? Absolutely. That's a good thought. Anyone agree with that? Taylor? Yeah? Any other reasons at play here? Absolutely, might right? Be a more prudential reason. Prudential reasons are right there. Absolutely. If you know your friend and you know what their work ethic is, right? Does it present any problems though to hire your friend? No. Like what? What if what if they royally mess up? That's on you, right? Absolutely. Are you thinking about it here? Now are you thinking about it now? Is this ethical? If you're thinking about how it reflects on you, what reason is that? Hedonic, prudential, aesthetic, or ethical? Hedonic, Hedonic why? Um, I know, that damn question, why? It's just the pleasure that you get from being right. Like, um, can you get your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, if, if you're thinking about how it benefits you. Yeah, like you're getting the pleasure from making sure that you're reflected that you're yeah. still respected in your yeah. workplace? Yeah, Chris. Is it more of a one that uh, is in your best interest? The prudential? Yeah. In your best interest, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would say that, right? When you're looking about your best interest, you're looking at prudential. But it could be, right, because it brings you pleasure to have the respect of your colleagues. There's another step in that particular dance, and that is, does anybody think that it would make a difference? Does he have, um, Jim, have an obligation to the image that his company um, has and whether it would be tarnished by having a reputation of making hiring decisions in this way? Does his reputation matter? Do, you, do your reputations matter? Yeah, absolutely. All right. We actually are running out of time. This is going faster than we expected, so I want to get to the last part. If, have you, if any of you, this is an old, old movie, so probably none of you have seen it, but there is an Al Pacino movie called The Scent of a Woman in which he says, the tango is the easiest dance. If you make a mistake and you get tangled up in your feet, you can just tango on. You can just keep dancing, right? 
you can pick up and keep going. And so staying true to our theme with Mother Teresa, she also had a similar thought process, right? It's called do it anyway. Have any of you heard of it? Yeah, a couple of you, right? She says, people are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies, but succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you, but be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow, like Norman Burlock, right? But do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough, but give your best anyway. Right? And that's kind of what we want you to do, is take this and think about your actions, why you're behaving the way you are, whatever that is, what weights you're giving each of those reasons, and do good anyway. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it.